So then I would like to thank all the authors. Now I would like to invite them to turn off their cameras to start the panel discussion. And for the participants, um, please uh, ask your questions in the chat or raise your hand so you can ask your question out loud. And also to the speakers, you are also welcome to ask to each other questions if you are interested on each other's work. So I saw a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, although the first one was already addressed in the chat, I would like to read it out loud so people who are not uh, joining us from Zoom can also know about the answer. So Gaurav asked to Abhishek, uh, did you do any study on whether customers would have chosen the top traditional search results if Alexa would have given them as an al alternate options to Amazon's choice? Yeah. Please, Abhishek. Um... Yeah. Yeah, so uh, to answer the exact question, no, we didn't actually do any uh, such studies because uh, in India, what we saw is that there is only one product for which uh, Alexa basically uh, spells out its details. And then there is, there is like uh, the exact transcript which I was showing. So the last sentence is like, if you want to purchase, I will just say order it now. That's it. So there was no, never an alternate option that Alexa essentially gave us. But the interesting, the, the question itself is interesting because when you talk about like, we just, this, we just uh, in this paper, we basically discussed about a smart speaker Alexa Echo Dot, right? Now it can actually like Amazon is now expanding the search experience, not only to smart speakers, but also say Fire Sticks, uh, Echo Show and all the things that all the Amazon devices that are there, almost through all of them, you can now do a, a product search and purchase something, right? So now, essentially, what is happening is that the 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 stakeholders and the uh, and the products, let's say, between them, the interfacing the interface that is there, the algorithm that is there. Now the algorithm, uh, so, so the mode of interaction between the two stakeholders is now actually changing. Earlier it was simply desktop search. It came to say uh, mobile apps, now smart speakers. So this entire line of, if you consider a line of autonomy, so the autonomy was at its peak when you are considering desktop search and it is at its lowest when you are considering a similar setup like smart speaker. So in between what is actually happening that is also an interesting study, which actually uh, can answer the question that Gaurav has suggested, where there is an op alternate option. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, then I will go to the next question addressed to James. Um, Siron asks, how often does we, uh, do we need to solve LP when we use mini batch training, for example, every epoch? Uh, James, we cannot hear you. Yeah, it's a it's a every data sample. So the main that's the main computational um, work of the algorithm. So you need a really efficient way of solving that LP because if you have um, a million data samples, you're going to solve it a million times. The way that you the main tool that you'll use to increase the uh, efficiency of that is hot starting. So in most types of optimization solvers, they'll give you an option to um, start your optimization search from a previously discovered point. And so during learning, you're to learn parameters of your model which uh, at some point will be expected to converge. And as the parameters converge, the predicted uh, cost vector in your linear program will not change very much in between iterations. And so when the object doesn't change very much, then the previous solution uh, should offer a good hot start. So particularly as you get close to convergence, the computation is likely to be the next to nothing for solving the LP. But it is, uh, it is one of the, um, the drawbacks of, of the method for, for sure that's going to, for one, it's going to limit the size of the, the rankings that you're able to compute. So the million sized rankings might not be viable without some, some adjustments to this 
to this model. Okay, perfect, thank you. Are there any questions for Professor Lim? Okay, Saram, thanks. Thank you, James, for the answer. Um, so I have a question for Professor Lim. It's a very high level question. Uh, could you please tell us a little bit about the trade-off between preserving privacy and assessing uh, fairness with your uh, method? Privacy, a trade-off and... Because it has been shown that, uh, for example, when you, in terms of uh, uh, fairness and accuracy, it's a trade-off. You cannot be very accurate and very private. I wonder whether the same effect is happening with privacy. Can you be super private and still achieve fairness, or is there a trade-off in between? So actually, yeah, in our, uh, under our framework, there is no trade-off between privacy and the accuracy. Actually, uh, to train the model, we are using uh, the Intel data, but we are transporting this data securely. Okay. So between two entities, we are sharing these pri uh, privacy information, but uh, we are just securely protecting this uh, data with a uh, secure channel. That's it. I see. Okay. So we, to uh, avoid... Uh, uh, cannot access, can access original data. So To avoid adversarial attacks or something along those lines? What? To avoid uh, or prevent adversarial attacks? Uh, pardon me, but I cannot, I cannot understand the last word, silent, what? To avoid adversarial attacks to the data, to their training data. It's okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry about this. Avoid, okay, okay, we can take it offline, sure. Yeah. Okay, are there any more questions? Um, now going back to Abhishek. Uh, I have a question regarding, regarding the, um, the queries. How general were the queries or they were very specific? Because I wonder maybe because the, the queries were too general, that's why there is a lot of room for just pushing up whatever Amazon wants. But the, the moment the query is very specific, perhaps uh, it's uh, by choice of the user that the answer will be more fair or more accurate. What do you, uh, did you look into that or what are your thoughts about it? We actually had uh, a, a good mix of queries, like some of the queries were single words, like let's say backpack, that's it, that's the query. And there were also some more very specific queries, like let's say Adidas backpack, Adidas mm -hmm. backpack for hiking and so on. So we actually collected these queries also from the different uh, product pages on Amazon so that uh, the analysis should not be only on the very uh, generic queries as you might suggest, Rather, it should also be for some of the specific queries, like a very informative query on its own, sort of. So you can also check the uh, data collection. Uh, I mean, we have actually ex ex explained this in the paper, like how we actually curated this thousand, the set of thousand queries uh, that can be actually a good And do you find any differences between the gener general questions and the specific questions, or the results uh, align or hold for both types of, of queries? Uh, the results actually hold for both the types of uh, mm -hmm. uh, both the types of uh, data. Uh, we were actually surprised to see that, like this this phrase, like let's say Amazon's choice, etc. It's not exact. Like uh, I mean, uh, let me just give a brief background about them so that it will actually become more clear to you. Like uh, it's not like uh, almost for every query that you actually search on Amazon, there is actually an Amazon's choice. I mean, if you even search for mm -hmm. desk on your desktop, there will be an Amazon's choice badge shown on one of the products. So and those product those uh, badges are actually given for a certain query. Now that query, it need not be very generic, like let's say backpack. It can also be very specific, like let's say Adidas backpack for hiking. So, uh, so in, in a sense that, uh, and why this is actually happening. So the, the inception of this Amazon's choice badge or the different types of badges is essentially to assist people shop through smart speakers. That was the time when Alexa was gaining its momentum. And that is when these badges actually came to the fore. And so, so essentially for genetic as well as specific queries, you have these uh, badges. And so the observations that we had were also kind of very similar across the board as well. Okay, fascinating. Thanks, thanks a lot. Yeah. 
Okay, now I have, a, a, are there more questions from the audience? Uh, Serum says that he has, he wants, or she, I don't, sorry, I don't know, um, wants to answer the question about the adversarial attack. Would you like to turn on your mic so you can tell us about that? Uh, Serum Park. Yeah, thank you for the great, great question about our work. Uh, our methods uh, just use the confidential computing technology, and this technology can uh, ensure the, the integrity of data. So when uh, some adversary tried to um, uh, change the input data from clients, our confidential computing method can uh, avoid uh, that kind of attack because we can check the, the integrity of data after getting the input from yeah, client. Yeah. yeah, so I think your point is very great to our work. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks, thanks a lot. Just in case this was a, a, an answer for the last talk. Uh, yes, and any more questions from the audience? Otherwise I have uh, one question for um, James. Uh, it's about the multi-group fairness that you uh, touch upon in the paper. So I wonder whether uh, you, you, what do you mean by multi-group fairness? Do you mean the intersectionality, like combining gender and, and ethnicity, for instance, being fair for both female and Latino communities or males and black communities? Because it has been shown that when you try to be fair for one of these subgroups, you might end up being unfair for other group, subgroups. So what, are, what did you find or what are your, your thoughts about uh, this inter intersectionality fairness? Or what do you mean by multi-group fairness in, in, your, in your paper? Okay, so multi-group fairness is just any, any case where there's more than two groups. So the fairness notion should be obvious when there's two groups, say male, female CEOs, if you want it to be fair, then they should have equal exposure. I guess if there were, so you have to go to something other than gender, I guess, if you're going to talk about multi-group fairness. So uh, sure, like some uh, like racial things, say there's five races and you want uh, you know equal exposure between those. Now you have to have, um, you have to consider fairness a little bit differently. So in terms of the intersectionality, I think it could be, it could be represented the, the same way, like whatever notion of fairness uh, constraint that you can come up with, you just add it as another constraint because ultimately the policy is determined by a, this linear programming problem and it can take as many constraints as you can give it as long as there's a feasible solution to that problem. Um, so there might be some analysis to be done if the solution is actually feasible. As long as it is, then it'll, it'll be computed by this model. So I one thing I could have emphasized if we have more time is that the previous methods for fair learning to rank, like I said, they're based on this, this penalty approach. So I don't know if, you, if you've uh, studied optimization generally, you see when people have difficult to, constraints to work with, they just put, they put a penalty term to the objective function, which tries to minimize the violation of the constraint. The reason you can't do that in multi-group fairness um, is because you, that technique really only works when you have one penalty term. Uh, one reason is because if you have several penalty terms, then you have to discover the uh, multiplier associated to every single penalty term. And it becomes like combinatorially harder to do that hyperparameter search. Now, when you only have uh, one constraint to deal with multi-group fairness, that's something that other research has done. So if you look at the papers that came before ours, they take um, a single constraint uh, term in the objective and they express it as the sum of all the violations of the multi-group fairness. So violation of fairness for this group, violation of fairness for this group, and you add them all together. But so my claim is that that's not really a legitimate uh, notion of multi-group fairness because that one constraint can be occupied by a single group. There's nothing preventing that. So in order to really make sure you have multi-group fairness, you need the ability to satisfy multiple constraints at once. 
So would you, you would yeah. say that you would need these uh, multiple uh, penalties uh, for each of the uh, groups? Or? Yeah, yeah. And so the, the way that you discover those penalties is just by searching. There's no real better way that's reliable. And so if you have to discover many of them, you have a multi-dimensional hyperparameter search, which is, is, is not really trackable. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the uh, question. No problem. Um, are there more questions from the audience or uh, speakers also? Please feel free to ask each other's uh, which other questions. If you're interested about Abhishek's work, James' work, or Professor Lim's work. Guys, don't be shy in the audience. If there are no more questions, I mean, I don't have more questions, then I think we can conclude the session unless someone raised the hand last minute or writes down the question last minute. No? Okay, then I would like to thank the authors for giving awesome presentations and thanks for uh, keeping track of the 15 minutes. You made my work very easy. And thanks for the organizers and hope to see you, I hope to see you around. Enjoy the conference. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you.